Tonight we continue our series in uh, Proverbs called Bodybuilding. The book of Proverbs makes the claim that living wisely, living God's way in God's world, is good for you. To live life fearing God, not fearing God's condemnation, but a right fear of God from the secure place of a covenant loving relationship with Him will bring to quote Proverbs, healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Wise living, right living is good for you. And what we're doing in this bodybuilding series is examining the short sayings found in Proverbs and spread throughout Proverbs about different parts of the body. And in doing this, we will be helped in fearing the Lord rightly and for turning or shunning evil. And we're approaching this task as Christians. And as Christians, we are firmly convinced that the basis of our salvation is God's gracious gift of a Savior who has died sacrificially for our sins in our place. We are made, we are made right with God through no merit of our own. We cannot add a single iota to our salvation. Nothing we have done or ever will do contributes to our justification. We are justified. We are made right with God. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as revealed in Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And so as we look at the exhortations in Proverbs uh, to do this and avoid that, we know that adherence to, adherence to such is not the basis for our justification, uh, but nevertheless, we are very keen to obey because we know that how we live in this life matters. Uh, how we live has consequences. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And since we love Jesus, we want to obey his commands. The Holy Spirit dwells within the Christian, and the Christian now has both the desire and the ability to live life pleasing to God, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And with that foundation laid, our task tonight is to consider what Proverbs says about our eyes. Now, eyes are a remarkable uh, thing. Uh, for those who hold a materialistic worldview where there is no God and where things simply came about by chance and by time and through random mutations, the eye is a source of baffling mystery for which there is no good explanation. For doctors and optometrists, so remarkable is the eye that a detailed eye examination is an astonishing and important tool that can help diagnose in the region of 20 or so diseases. Uh, on Sunday past, Alan began his sermon in the morning by asking, what is the most glorious sight you have ever seen? Was it the Grand Canyon, a newborn child, your bride walking down the aisle, or, or what was it? Uh, eyes and sight are a remarkably uh, good gift from God. For those with vision that is impaired, for those who need glasses, for those whose eyesight, uh, like myself, is getting a little bit worse as uh, you age, eyes can be a reminder that we live in a fallen world. Our eyes are remarkable. Now, in Proverbs, as with other parts of the body, the eyes are considered often metaphorically. What I mean is this, the eyes in Proverbs are often viewed as the directive faculty of the soul. The directive faculty of the soul. And that's to quote Charles Hodge. What he's saying is that when we read about eyes in Proverbs, the author is using the eyes to represent our desires. Desires that we can chase after for good or for evil. And for that reason, our eyes can be a dangerous inlet into the soul. Again, to quoting Hodge. 
In just the same way that our physical health, our body, can be affected by what we eat, what we take in through our mouth, so the soul's health can be affected by what our eyes seek after, what we desire. Well, tonight we're going to begin our time in Proverbs in chapter 4 with a passage that was read out earlier. It's a good place to start because it sets our eyes in a wider context. Uh, We're going to look at these verses and then we're going to supplement uh, these verses in chapter 4 with a few other uh, verses from elsewhere in Proverbs that speak about our eyes. And we're going to do all this under the following heading. It's our first heading. Our eyes will either keep us on the right path or they will lead us astray. And after we've looked at this point, we're going to turn our attention to what else Proverbs has to say about the eyes. But to begin, our eyes will either keep us on the right path or they will lead us astray. Look at verse 25 by way of reminder, chapter 4 of Proverbs and verse 25. It says, let your eyes look directly forwards and your gaze be straight before you. Now, on its own, verse 25, I think, would be open to a number of different interpretations. But the meaning is crystal clear from verses 26 and 27, which continue the author's train of thought. Verse 26 says, Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. So it is clear that we are being exhorted in verse 25 to keep our eyes fixed on the path that is before us, the path we are walking. It's a metaphor, isn't it? And I know that in Proverbs, you could turn to any page in Proverbs and put your finger on the page, and you'll likely be pointing at a metaphor. Proverbs is stuffed with metaphor, with language that is vivid and is visual in its nature. And this path that is being referred to Uh, in verses 26 and 27, and I think implied in verses 25, keep your eyes on the the path. This path uh, is the path that leads to life. It's a metaphor. It's a straight and narrow path. Our eyes to be fixed ahead during life's journey as we seek to walk, as we seek to live God's way in God's world, to live fearing God and shunning evil. If our eyes were to look to the left and get distracted, we might trip up on our way. If our eyes look to the right, we might, verse 27, swerve to the right. Our feet may choose a different path and we'd uh, leave the path and we'd find ourselves on a a street called uh, not God's way in God's world. Uh, We would leave the path called fear God and shun evil. There's a famous scene in Pilgrim's Progress when the path that the main characters are taking, the main characters at this point are Christian and hopeful, uh, that path that they're walking down, it becomes difficult. It becomes a challenging path. And hopeful looks over to the side and he sees an easier path that seems to be going the same way, but through a pleasant meadow. It's called Byway Meadow. Christian and hopeful decide to follow that way. They leave the path. Their eyes have seen an easier route. Uh, But lo and behold, bad weather comes, the meadow becomes flooded, and they find themselves in a spot of bother. And that scene in Pilgrim's Progress articulates the same sentence, the same sentiment as the author of verses 25 through 27 of our chapter 4. Our eyes can lead us astray. Our eyes can perceive an easier way. Our eyes can desire a certain something. And before we know it, we've wandered just a little way off. And suddenly we're surrounded in water up to our necks. Now, I think this little verse about the eyes, verse 25 of chapter 4, is helpful because it's set in a wider context Uh, not just verses 25 to 27 that we've looked at, uh, but these verses flow from verses 20 to 22. Let's look at verses 20 and following by way of reminder. It says, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them escape from your sight, your eyes again. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. 
The early chapters of Proverbs know this, are dominated by this loving and concerned father who is eager to pass on wisdom and counsel to his son. The father never communicates this wisdom, this counsel in a neutral, passive way. The father is urgent. The father is solemn. The father pleads with his son. And so he says, verse 20, my son, be attentive to what I say. Incline your ear. Listen carefully. And that which you hear, verse 21, let it not escape from your sight. Remember my words. Hold on to my words. Store up my words within you. The Father provides a reason for this zealous counsel, verse 22, for they are life to all who find them. And it's after the Father exhorts His Son to hold on to His teaching. It's teaching first. He then gives counsel on the heart, the mouth, the eyes, and the feet. And this pattern of listening and holding on to truth first, the head knowledge, which in turn uh, informs our affections and our actions, what we say with our mouth, look at with our eyes, direct our feet in life. It's not limited to proverbs, but that pattern is found elsewhere. Romans 12, for example, verse 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. It starts with the renewal of our minds. We come to faith in Christ. Then we have our worldview, our notion of what is right and good and true changed through our consuming this truth and holding on to it and stirring, storing it up in our hearts. And in doing that, we find that our affections change and how we speak, it changes. And what we look at and what we desire with our eyes, it changes. And the direction we walk in life, it changes. It all flows from the truth embedded in us. So in summary, these verses in chapter 4, and especially verse 25 through 27, teach us that our eyes, where we are looking, what our desires are, what we aim for in life, will either keep us on the right path or lead us astray, but it's informed first by the truth that we hold on to. Here's an interesting line of inquiry for us now. How much of a potential do our eyes have to lead us astray? And how serious could the consequences be? Our eyes will keep us on the right path or they'll lead us astray. If they do lead us astray, uh, how serious could the consequences be? And how much of a potential do our eyes have to lead us astray? Well, we need to only to think of Genesis 3 and verse 6. Let me read it. It will be familiar to you. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruits and ate. Then she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. She saw, she perceived that which she saw was a delight. She desired that which she saw, and she took and she ate. Her eyes led her feet to swerve from the path, so to speak. And where did it lead? It led to death. Christian, know that similar danger is before you. As you walk life's journey, you will be tempted to look to the right and tempted to look to the left, to that which you know is displeasing to God. And going after that can lead to death. Whatever your eyes, sorry, whether your eyes are drawn to materialism and wealth, and comforts, and riches, and possessions, such that your eyes cause your feet to swerve from the path, and you pursue these things at all costs, and you find that you've been led down the road called, I have no need of God, and you live on the street called self-reliance. Your eyes can be drawn to materialism, and you can swerve from the way or whether your eyes are drawn to lust, drawn to what Proverbs 2 verse 16 calls the forbidden woman from the adulteress, the same woman who in chapter 5 is described as having lips that drip with honey, 
And in chapter 6 is having eyelashes that can capture you. This is written from a father to a son, remember, but the same principle would apply to a mother giving advice to a daughter to avoid the promiscuous man. No friends that we live in a hyper-sexualized culture where we expose to hyper-sexualized visual content frequently. In fact, never before, never before in the history of the world has so much sexualized content been produced, normalized, and made available with the greatest of ease. Men and women are in a world where it is easy to see and easy to see more and to desire that which is seen and to take and to eat. No Christian, it leads to death. In the language of Proverbs, one whose eyes have taken them off the road and strayed from the path following their lust is like an ox who goes to the slaughter, or like a stag that gets caught, or like a bird in a snare. Proverbs says that leaving the path and following the eyes after lust leads to the chambers of death. There was once a lady who grew up in a respectable, loving family. She earned a degree, a good degree. She had an important and well-paid job working as a chemist for the equivalent in the U.S. of the procurator fiscal. Whenever a drug dealer was caught, her job was to test the drugs to see exactly what kind of drug it was. Um, And her evidence would be used to convict that drug dealer, that criminal. She was good at her job. She did her job faithfully for many years. But one day she wondered what the drugs she was testing were really like. She was curious. She often gazed. She often looked at the uh, jar containing the pure version of the drug that was used as a control. And that desire grew. And so one day she took, she placed a single drop on her tongue using a pipette, and that single drop, one drop, in time led to a spiraling drug habit, led to her losing her job, led to the successful overturning of years of criminal convictions of drug dealers. She saw with her eyes, she desired Her feet left the path, she took, she drank, and catastrophe came. No Christian that taking your eyes off the path, taking your eyes off of Christ, of not fixing your eyes on things above, Colossians 3, has the potential to lead you astray, has the potential to lead you down a dark, dark path. And if you know yourself, be in that dark place today if your eyes have led you astray some time ago, or if one day in the future you find that your eyes have led you to a dark, dark place, that you've taken a wrong turn, and know that you already know the way back if you are in Christ. The day back is repentance, is confess your sins to God, it's to cry out to Him for forgiveness and help, it's to denounce denounce your sins as evil, as grievous to God. It's to turn from that sin. It's to take drastic action as part of your repentance. Actions equivalent to Jesus' metaphorical exhortation to cut off your hand, to pluck out your eye. God will not despise the repentant sinner. We do need to move on Uh, from this first point. This first point is that our eyes will either keep us on the right path or they will lead us astray. But before we move on, let me just add two other verses from elsewhere in Proverbs that speak to this same truth. Uh, You can look it up if you want, Proverbs 17 and verse 24 says this, Proverbs 17 and verse 24, "'The discerning sets his face towards wisdom.'" But the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. 
this discerning Christian will always prize wisdom, will always look to wisdom, will always have wisdom before them in whatever decision needs to be made. They will consider how to please God uh, when they make that decision. Their face and eyes look to wisdom. It's always before them. The fool, on the other hand, looks every which way. They look to many things and grand things, and they change what they're looking at constantly. Instead of looking ahead, they look to the ends of the earth, and they end up going round in circles, led astray. And similarly, if you fast forward to Proverbs 27 and verse 20, Proverbs 27 and 20 says, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, and never satisfied are the eyes of man. And when the author says Sheol and Abaddon, he means death or the grave, or perhaps even the angel of destruction. And what he means is just as death and the grave never have their fill, they're never satisfied, so too the eyes of men and women can be insatiable. They can be ravenous, never satisfied. Uh, their greed uh, can lead to a life of no contentment, no thankfulness for what they have. Such a person is always looking away from the path. They're always looking to the left, to the right for the next thing. And they too end up going round in circles, led astray and lost. So that's our first point behind us. Our eyes have the potential to keep us on the right path, and they have the potential to lead us astray. Now, Proverbs does have other things to say about our eyes, and I've grouped uh, the remaining seven verses, which mention eyes, into three headings. And we're going to look at each in turn, but we're going to do so in a much more brief fashion. We're really just going to read out the verse and maybe give a comment or two on each one. Our second heading is this, is that our physical eyes can betray an evil heart. Our physical eyes can betray an evil heart. We'll see this in Proverbs 16. We're flicking back and forward here, but Proverbs 16 and verse 30 says this, whoever winks his eyes plans dishonest things. He who purses his lips brings evil to pass. We're not talking metaphorically here, I don't think. We can actually discern a person's evil intentions through their physical eyes. The wink here is not a playful wink. It is mischievous. It's been used to trick, to deceive, to send a signal to an accomplice in evil. And something similar is going on in Proverbs 31 and verse 17. We read there. So it's not Proverbs 31 and verse 17. It's Proverbs 30 and verse 17. It says there, the eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Quite vivid, quite dramatic. Again, I think the physical eyes of this son towards his father betray an evil heart. His eyes are used to mock his father. They're disparaging towards him. Likewise, his face and eyes scorn his mother uh, and Proverbs teaches that judgment is coming his ways. Our physical eyes can betray an evil heart. One more example of this, which might be moving in a metaphorical direction, is Proverbs 21 and verse 4, which says this, a haughty eyes and a proud heart. The lamp of the wicked are sin. The one whose eyes are haughty looks down on others I think the sense here is the one who is prideful in action and in their heart, and they sin. A haughty eyes and a proud heart are like a lamp in that they direct the evil person, and they guide their actions, guides the life of the wicked person. And again, I think this verse says that we can perceive an evil heart by how the eyes view others. Their physical eyes can betray an evil heart. Let's move on to a third area of Proverbs teaching on the eyes, which is this. The eyes can be used for good or for evil. Proverbs 20, verse 8. We're on the same page, perhaps. Proverbs 20, verse 8 says, A king who sits on the throne of judgment winnows all evil with his eyes. This is a good king using his authority in a good way. He looks out on his kingdom 
And with his eyes, he is seeking to identify evil and restrain evil. He roots out the evil. And know that this king is uh, doing what God himself will do. God will do this very thing. Jesus said this in a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, God will root out evil from uh, his kingdom, just as this king in Proverbs 28 does. Uh, Proverbs 28, 27 uses uh, eyes as an example for evil. It says, 28, verse 27, whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. Uh, To hide our eyes from need is to allow our love to grow cold, and Jesus warned against such. It's evil. Uh, Yes, we can't meet every need, but to meet no needs to never be moved by compassion by what your eyes see, to never give generously uh, according to what you have seen with your eyes, to hide your eyes when someone is in need is to be displeasing to God. Our eyes can be used for good or for evil. Okay, we're, we're at the end. A final verse and a final category. The final category is this. Eyes can be used to deceive their owner. And the final verse we'll look at is Proverbs 26 and verse 16. The sluggard we read there is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. The sluggard that Irfan spoke so well of last week is not only lazy, but he's prideful. And his pride has led to a blindness towards himself. His eyes have led to an overestimation of himself. Everyone else can see he's a fool because he's too quick to speak and too slow to listen. Even if seven men, seven men, the the perfect number in Hebrew, answer sensibly, the sluggard still looks inside and thinks to himself, I am still wiser. Proverbs teaches that the eyes can deceive their owner. And there we have it. That is a summary of Proverbs teaching on the eyes. Taking to heart these positive examples Uh, regarding our eyes and avoiding the evil examples will help us to fear God and shun evil. It will bring health to our bodies and refreshment to our souls. Know that Jesus mirrors the teaching of Proverbs about the eyes when he says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Looking to Christ, keeping your eyes fixed on Him as your treasure will ensure that you don't swerve to the left or to the right. Will ensure that your eye is healthy and your body full of light. Do you recall when Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus in John's Gospel how he must be born again, that is, how he might be saved and belong to God. Jesus said this, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In Moses' day, in order to be saved from God's judgment, being manifest through an infestation of poisonous snakes, which were biting people because of their disobedience, all they needed to do was to look was to use their eyes to look at a pole with a snake on it. Just turn and look and see and behold with their eyes. And Jesus is calling us to behold Him with our eyes, behold Him on the cross, crucified in the place of sinners. Just turn, just look, just see with your eyes and behold. And once our eyes are fixed on Him for salvation, keep our eyes fixed on Him throughout all of life. Keep gazing forward on Him. Keep looking to Him. Uh, Jesus invites us to turn our eyes to the hillside where justice and mercy embrace, 
where the Son of God gave his life for us and our measureless debt was erased. Amen. And let's pray before we sing those verses for ourselves. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we do indeed want to look at Christ not only for salvation, but as our prize for all of life. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Him and help us to keep seeking to please Him. Protect us, Lord God, from being distracted from walking on that path. Protect our eyes from wandering off to the left or the right and for us deviating from the path. Uh, Lord God, help us always to keep our eyes fixed on Christ our prize and on things above. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.